Yes. Uh, and we've seen that. Uh, some of us, uh, uh, when we were at school, uh, we were told that in 1852, uh, there was a guy called Jan van Riebeek who came and discovered us. Uh, it's because somebody's writing a story. <laughs> and if you, do, if you write the story, in fact, you know, I must tell this, I was in Lisbon the other day, and, uh, and I was, they took us on a tourist uh, uh, trip, and they took us to a place where it's almost like a museum. I mean, uh, and it's, it's, it's got a map of, of the whole continent on this whole floor. And then it's got a lot of statues. And people like Simon van der Stel, uh, Vasco da Gama, these are heroes there. And they've got big statues of them. And they call them the, the, the heroes of uh, frontiers. And, and I looked at this and I listened to that. And everybody was excited and I thought to myself, oh, my dear God. These are colonialists who are coming to this country, <laughs> and there they are celebrated as heroes, you know? And, and their statues are there and all over. <clears throat> the question is who's right, who's got a pen, eh? Yeah. If you've got a pen, you write what you, you tell, you, 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 you want to write. So, we're very glad today. Uh, Bramak is here, and he's a, from Guatemala. Where are the kids from Guatemala? Where are they? They told me they are coming. Yeah, Tando, about Afi. They're on the way. Yeah. They're on the way. Yeah. Tando, you must have come with them, man. All right, we'll start, but they, we'll, we'll, we'll recognize them when they come here. Uh, but Bramike, I'm going to just give a little bit of his background and then hand over to Confidence, uh, because Confidence is doing all the job. <coughs> um, also want to welcome all those that are online, please, uh, uh, you, thank you for participating. In fact, his full name is Michael Solomon. Yeah. Dead. Solomon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon. <laughs> Brasso. It's a sad Solomon. Those songs we used to sing. I yeah. was born and grew up in Guatemala, and then when the Guatemala kids come here, uh, we'll acknowledge them uh, quite pleased, uh, make sure that we, they, they meet <coughs> Ramaik. He obtained his BA degree at the University of the North. You see, I told you about Teflop. Uh, yeah, he approached was a Teflop. <laughs> Even the current president was at the Teflop. Uh, <laughs> French guy. I also went to Teflop, by the way. Uh, in the, uh, uh, I brought Ashok Ramak, you, uh, you, uh, you are much more ahead of us. Uh, and a BA honors at the University of Johannesburg and an MBA at UNISA, Open University. But he was a, he's a teacher. He taught in 1990 and until 1991 at Kenneth Masagela High School, where he completed his high school education and then served in various human resources roles in Unilever, Bayer, Impala, Platinum, PHP, Billiton, before becoming one of the founding members of Optimum Co., where he was appointed CEO, became the vice president of the Chamber of Mines, now it's called Mineral Council, in 2011 and the president of 2013, until 2017, he was appointed the chairman of Richards Bay Coal Terminal in 2012, stepped down and become non-executive director of the board and chairman of remuneration committee. Today, Mike is the CEO of Serite Holdings, the company he co-founded in 2018. Serite, Serite, Serite. And uh, we're talking about it. So he's actually responsible for coal, mining coal. And uh, don't be fooled uh, about all the theories around uh, coal. It's important that we have, you use all our resources in Africa. To become one of the South Africa's largest coal mining companies, a major exporter of thermal coal, is also an executive chairman and controlling shareholders of Massimo Group Holdings, a diversified investment company. In addition, Mike serves as a non-executive chairman of Rolfs, and an anchor group. He's also a founder. You see, he's founding things. Yeah? <laughs> That's what ULP is about. Yep. Encouraging people to find, start stuff, particularly business. And a main shoulder of Lady Dorothy Investments and is a board member of DNI. Importantly, his leadership uh, achievements were recognized when he became the chairperson of the Council of the University of Johannesburg. For many, many years, he was leading the Council of Johannesburg. We're talking about it's important for all of us 
to when we've learned something, go and plow it back. Uh, Mark is married to Sandile and have two children, Boyko Konya. Oh, there you are. There's the students. Hey, come, come, wow. come, come in. I'm waiting for you. Come in. Just clap hands for the students. Hey, I like the way they're wearing their uniform. There were a number of students coming from different towns. Uh, which, which one? Uh, because the Guatem. Is this Guatem? Are you yeah. from Guatem? Yes. I'm so unbending and born and born. It's in Zanga. Obra Mike will tell you that he also was born and bred in Guatemala, so you're coming to listen to your own. <laughs> and they married to two children, very good. And Okuliso, uh, grandmother, was raised by a grandfather, so Dorothy Tek, Tek, and, 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 and his mother died when he was a kid. So you have no excuse. I want to tell you, I'm and I have never met my father, you see? And I like you saying this, my commitment is to be a great father to Boikanya and Tiamo, a loving husband to Sandile. I cherish that thought. Wonderful. Confidence doesn't need any introduction. Confidence uh, uh, pioneered the ULP Authors Forum. He runs his own publishing campaign. So if you want to you publish your own book, you, you're welcome. Uh, he's published my book, so I know that. He's done a good job. But uh, I am really passionate uh, about uh, the work he's doing. Well done. Let's give Confidence a round of applause. And at the end, I am told that you will get this book. The future of leadership is collegiality. Is that right? Is That's there the, at the end? Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. Thank you. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, you know, at ULP, we believe in we believe in uh, giving people their flowers, and I think it's important to mention that earlier this week, uh, in the financial mail, they announced that uh, WBS West Business School. Uh, came out as number one, tops, in two categories, schools that employers know well and school considered for executive education. So that is listed number one. And I know that is due to the leadership of this man right here. Uh, one, one thing I love about Prof is that he's a visionary, and when he started there, this was the exact objective. He said, I want to take vets business school back to the top, and he's doing exactly that. Can we just honor him again? Uh, Dr. Tege, you've been welcomed, but please allow me to also welcome you to your P Authors Forum. Thank you, thank you. Um, in doing my research, uh, uh, one of the things that I was firmly able to establish is that you're not a Catholic priest. I'm not a Catholic priest. You are not a Catholic priest. However, I want to start our conversation with a confession. Okay. <laughs> so in my early years, I went to a school called Sijadipudi. Sijadipudi, those who know Sipedi will translate. Sijadipudi. And at Sijadipudi, we were taught English Kasipedi. Yeah. And when I read the title of your book, I understood it to a point. Sure. And then I went back to my Sijadipudi English. Yeah. So for the sake of those who are like me who were taught English Kasipedi, or maybe English Kasivenda or Kasizulu, I know the Tsonga guys are, are fine because Changa Nishlongwa here. <laughs> but for the rest of us, can you please explain what collegiality is? And what, why it's so important? So I think let's start with your problem because you come from Limpopo. And I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> so when you go to Durban, mm. you struggle to say that, and we don't understand your Yatepe. Yeah, Yatepe, yeah. <laughs> 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 Now, guys, yeah. on a serious note, 
I was raised in this world called corporate South Africa. And uh, the industry, whatever industry I've worked in, I've, I've, I was fortunate to be a graduate trainee at Unilever. And uh, after my teaching period of a year, having joined Unilever, I learned a lot of lessons. And over a period of years, I learned that when you grow up in the corporate sector, you learn to emulate things. You tend to mimic, you tend to imitate people. And young people I talk to these days, male or female, black, white, I say to you, when you're 23, 24, 25, you arrive in a business, you look at senior people. And I'm talking about you young people that, uh, who have ambi an ambition to be something in life. And I realized that as we were growing up, then we learned these traits, we learned these skills, we learned these attitudes and behaviors. And when you sit in a boardroom, you came across people who would scream at people, right? Mm. Make noise and yep. be very, very bombastic. And they scream and they hit the table. And you thought it was right. That's how success is. Yep. This guy is successful because he does these things. Yeah. Then you come across these bosses who walk in the corridors. And uh, one of them is in this room. I'll, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> <clears throat> so they walk, they use big words, and they sweat people, and they throw things at people. And there's this macho thing that we were told about. Then there were articles which were written over the years about the alpha male, mm. yep. the A-type personality. Yep, yep. And you think all these things are right. These are the things for me to be in this box, to be the next big thing. I must do these things. Yeah. So I watched these things over the years, and I said to myself, why is it difficult that when we sit in a debate in a boardroom or in an executive or committee meeting, that you become open, number one. You become comfortable in your skin. You speak to people like you're speaking to human beings. Yes, sir. You become a decent human being. Mm -hmm. But you drive the point about delivery and performance. But just be decent. You know, the best thing I've always given feedback to people on is to be able to say, firstly, let's understand that I'm not your friend. Okay, we work together and we are part of a team. I'm not going to ingratiate with you and be friendly with you and fraternize with you, but I'm decent and I'll tell you, these are my expectations and this is how we deliver. And that's being collegial. You're talking to people in a decent, just like a human being. My grandmother used to make an interesting comment. He used to say, people are not dogs. I never understood that there was still a little boy. Dogs will show you their teeth when they're angry. Yeah. You know, then you get scared. Human beings shouldn't do that. Our mouths are not designed that way. So just be a decent human being. If you tell a person that no, just do it in such a way that it's decent. And that's what collegiality is. Why don't we become collegial in telling each other the truth? If you tell a person that you are not talented, you don't have the skill, you don't have the capacity to deliver, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to leave. Why when we fire people, we have to fist, clench fist and fight? And after that anger, and people who have experienced it, that conversation where it's stressful and you're fighting and you're screaming at people. After people have left your office, mm. you're the only one who's left with chest pains. Yeah. And Comments. you open the drawers, you're looking for disprint and all those things. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to research this in my head and said, for us to achieve success, and I've tried it and I've tested it, that I've tried, by the way, people say, are you collegial? It doesn't mean when you teach people something, you should be that thing. Do as I say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, no, no. What am I getting to? I'm getting mm. to the point where I'm saying I am learning as well yeah. to be collegial because yes, I find it, it works, it's useful, it's healthy. Yeah. In the book, I talk about when you go to work and you're always fighting from 8 o'clock in the morning, you're swearing at this person, you're screaming at this on the phone, you throw things around. I'm sure when you arrive at home at 5 in the afternoon, even dogs run away from you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because you're so angry. I mean, yeah. Your wife asks you a question, how was your day? You're just bitter. Mm. So that's where the whole conversation started. 
between myself and myself. Yes. And I said, I need to write about this. And I, there are so many cases that I pick up and talk about. Is there such a thing as being overly collegial? And you also yes. touched on two other uh, subjects which you cover quite extensively in the book, fraternizing yes. and ingratiating. Yes. So please touch on being overly, because somebody may take this message but overdo it. Yeah. So please touch on that and then the two other concepts. You know, let's first start, when I talk about people being collegial, I'm not saying uh, be nice as in sell the farm, Pro sell the, the proverbial way of selling the farm. In other words, you become so weak yeah. and you're joking with people, you're laughing with people, and you end up not being able to sit one-on-one -on -one with your, your direct reports and say, it looks as though we're not achieving results. It looks as though we're not delivering because you've lost it. You've become so over collegial. And that is caused by, as an example, you, you're starting to ingratiate. You become too friendly with people. The world is about creating that balance. The world is about being able to create that balance. And it starts where, as an example, you can walk around and play games with your little boy who's six or seven years old, kick a soccer ball outside the yard. But there are times where things change when you sit at the dinner table after dinner and say, can I check your math book? Yeah. The game changes, right? Yeah. The game changes. Yeah. You become unfriendly in a way <laughs> to say, the world. that's why I'm saying the world is about creating that balance. So mm -hmm. in business, I find there are these people who start to fraternize become friendly with people, become nice with people, and you lose the, 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 lines up, the, 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 the line of authority is blurred. And when I talk about ingratiating, it leads to a stage where one thing that I'm careful of, and people who work with me who are in this audience will tell you, I will never ever over the weekend spend time with people I work with. No, I'm not your friend. I don't go to soccer matches and rugby and have fun and lose that. I don't ingratiate, I don't fraternize because I've learned over the years. But when I speak to you, often, I'll make sure that if I tell you the story, it will come across as though, did I, oh, what, what, you know, yeah. got the message. Yeah. And I make sure that you walk back to your desk and do your job. Yeah. But let's make sure that we behave like human beings should. That's what it is all about. You come from the mining industry, which is quite notorious for labor disputes, <laughs> uh, fierce negotiations. Mm. How have you found that environment as it relates to collegiality? Is yeah. it an environment where you, you can be collegial, or do you have to have that strong hand and force it a little bit? That's a good point. You know, most of the people who were growing up in the mining industry specifically, that's what you were taught. You've got to be tough, okay? Even when you go to a mine, let's take it's an underground mine. People who become shift bosses, who become mine captains, who become uh, a, a section manager, then mine manager, they grow up to be that tough. They use that language. It's mm. strong, it's heavy language. And that is why when you talk about women in mining, in the mining industry, there has been at some stage the struggle for women to survive in that environment. But they are doing well now. Yep. There are great mine overseers. Mine, the most productive and the people who drive proper teams underground right now, I find the females are doing a fantastic job. But people to grow and become a general manager, that's the language we were taught. Be tough, don't take the word that starts with S. Yeah and the F word is all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you told the lie. Yeah. And as you grow up, you think it's right. I'll give you an example, and I mention again in a section in the book where I worked for a company where the CEO used to wear white shirts every day, white shirts only. And he used to wear a vest. So you could see the vest inside the shirt. Do you get that? I do. And, uh, I noticed, and I learned this over the years, that young people who are aspiring to grow, they dress like him, <laughs> right? No, 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 they dress like him. Well, when I got first. Yeah, and I noticed that as we grow up in the mining industry, people end up walking like that person. 
<laughs> there is a big listed global company. I won't mention its name. It's a listed mining company. Go and do your research. <laughs> the juniors who came after the really, how can I, charismatic CEO, yeah. the really powerful charismatic CEO, CEO. CEO. proper CEO. Yeah. They walk like him. They mm. speak like him. Mm. They just they just just are like their CEO. Yeah. Because probably they watch this and they think it's right. Mm. And that's what I'm talking about. Say, the generation we're raising now of young people, guys who are aspiring to be great entrepreneurs, to negotiate, it's tough. To negotiate a transaction is tough. I've brought in a young man here who works with me in negotiating transactions. You end up fighting with people. But because you are growing up and you've learned over the years, at, at my level, I've learned to be able to become and be able to say, let me be collegial. Let's have a conversation. And what, I'm, what I mean by that, in a transaction, you are able to say, listen, I don't like your transaction. It's not a great transaction, and it's a no. But because you've become so friendly with people, you start to sugarcoat conversations. Yeah. No, 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 we'll come back to you tomorrow. And you're raising people's hopes, right? Yeah. A person says, I think I've got a transaction with Mike. Yeah. Instead of just being nice and say, listen, I like your story, I hear your story, but guess what, it's not going to happen. Yeah. There's a, that's a beautiful point. There's a, it reminds me of a quote that says, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Exactly. So, <laughs> collegiality is not about weakness. No. no. So can you delve deeper into that? Because I, I like what you said, in the admitting that you've had struggles with being collegial. But it means there's a toughness within you that is able to come out when necessary. Is that part and parcel of being collegial? There's one thing that, and please, it shouldn't come across as if I'm arrogant. I must confess that when I was young, the arrogance part of me, it's there. I was born arrogant. No, 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 honestly, but I've learned over the years to manage such things. Yeah. What I mean by that is, because I was raised by a tough, grandmother. My grandmother was tough, but one thing I'm proud of, my grandmother was never abusive. She never abused anybody. She raised me properly. By the way, I'm writing another book now. It will come out very soon. I talk about her a lot. My grandmother was so strong a personality. So it, I, I, I know I am a strong personality. That is why success for me is not negotiable. When we do things, we fight hard. But the fighting is different. The fighting for me is about grit. Um, I don't walk away from things. I don't walk away easily. If I want something, I am going to get it. But it's the way I approach things. And those are the lessons I'm sharing with young people to say, you think back, you step back, and you say, slow down now. Just be decent. And you talk to people that this is, the, this is what is happening. The transactions we've done in building Seriti, there were tough times. Mm. There were times when journalists were chasing me, writing really strange stories. Yeah. And somebody asked me a question <clears throat> and said to me, Mike, are you angry about some of the articles that have been written? And I said, you must remember, some of the people who do those things are sick people. They need yeah. help. <laughs> So, do you understand? I but do. Had I been a different person at the time and approached it differently, I would say, let me fight back. Yeah. Let me write back as well and mm. respond. I've grown up to reach a stage where I am relaxed about being able to approach tough conversations and tough things. So, to answer your question, that grit won't go away. The strength that my grandmother gave me and the challenges that I've faced growing up in Guatemala. And I think Prof. Khatebe is right to say, you come across people saying I'm an orphan and the like. For me, I don't care about that. I never, I don't know my father. My mother died when I was a little boy. But the fighting spirit in me, nobody will stop me. Nobody. I want, I want to delve deeper into that. You know, when we, as young people, when we look at people like you and you're at the mountain peak, we, we sometimes fail to understand that the mountain peak there's a foot where that mountain begins. So can you take us back to your upbringing and talk particularly about some of the challenges that you faced growing up? 
So I was raised in Guatemala in Springs, and uh, as I said, I was raised by a grandmother. We were, we were really poor. Uh, there was nothing at home. I mean, my grandmother never worked, never went to school. But the first thing I must share with you, and it's in my other book, you'll read it one day. My grandmother used to wake me up at quarter to four in the morning. And I would hear the <laughs> stove. I would hear that now she's making the fire. And I would wake up and she would prepare the basin with water and help me wash and walk with me to school. Those who come to, from Guatemala will understand and relate to this. I, there were two Tswana schools in Guatemala. There was a school called Sechava, which was not far from my home. For some reason, I was taken to the furthest school called Fred. <laughs> I don't know why. And she used to walk with me wow. in the morning yeah. and leave me there and come back home. And in the afternoon, I'll find my way home. The second fascinating thing about that is this. During school holidays, because we were a big home with cousins, you know, lots of cousins. We had so many in, the home, in, in our home. My grandmother never stopped waking me up at quarter to four. What? During school holidays? Day. <laughs> no, honestly, now I reflect on this thing that she will still wake me up. I'll dress up and oh. sit and watch people going to work. So that is ingrained in me. The people who work with me will tell you, um, I still am, um, if you want to call, talk to me, talk to me early that morning, in yeah. the morning, you'll, you'll catch me right. Wow. I'm, I'm strong at that time, that's when my day starts. Mm. That's the first thing. The second important thing is, guys, I struggled in the township with my complexion. I'm sure you understand. <laughs> <laughs> so I call myself a pavement special because, so, Guys in the township used to ask me that question. Are you colored? Do you know if you grew up in a township? Yeah. Are you colored? And they used to call me names and all these different names because they never understood. I don't look like a black person, right? Yes, sir. You'll think I'm colored, right? Yeah. And if you came across me, you'll speak in a different way. Yeah. And that somebody thought was going to be an obstacle. Mm. Muzi Kuzuai, who's a friend of mine. Yes, sir. He's grown up with me, and he's always said to me, Mike, the resilience. Yeah. Because if I was somebody, I would have run away. Mm. It was difficult. Guys, I played soccer. People will give me names. Yeah. It was just difficult. Mm. That's the second part. Mm. The third big thing was a decision from my side that I told my sister that I wanted to go to university. And my sister said to me, hey, it's difficult going to university. Firstly, you need to pass my trick. The second one, you need money, and there's no money here. How do we do it? And I used to tell her that I am going to university. Oh. University, that's where I'm going. Mm. And she said, why? And I said, because everybody gets a degree, right? Yeah. And I want to have a degree. <laughs> <laughs> and you tell me how it's going to happen. I worked for 12 months after my trick mm. at a factory called Van Leer in Springs. And I managed to save money to take myself to university. Wow. Unfortunately, that was yeah. after. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was after my grandmother had passed away a long time ago. Mm. Unfortunately, I never failed at school, so I sort of managed to get my way around things. I was not the brightest kid at school. But the biggest thing I look back on, it's one thing and one thing only. And I want black kids, white kids, children, guys, you must be gritty. You need to fight. Mm. I find the generation I'm seeing today, and it worries me, it's the weakness of the heart. Mm. You know, you, you, you scour the land and you look for weaknesses. You look for opportunities that are easy. Guys, nothing comes easy. Every time, all of you, you want to own a small corner cafe. I have no issues about those small things. Please don't misunderstand me. I am, I just want you to build big things. Yeah. Big yeah. things. Amen. You know, my pain, confidence is, yes. I'm sorry to belabor this. No, 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 please. My pain is, I look at the JSE today, and I'm saying, I'm not seeing a young black person who's building something and come to us and say, I want to list this thing. It was a concept, it became an idea, it's real now. I want help. Everybody wants to start. Guys, you, you're starting small things. And those things make you angry. And when they don't become successful, then you start to 
resent life and you start to resent other people who are successful. It's that fighting spirit that I don't see. We don't fight, honestly. When Anglo put up their assets for sale, and somebody who's sitting in front here is smiling, I know, <laughs> because I told him, I said, I'm going to buy these assets. Mm -hmm. And Anglo put a hefty price on, the pri on these assets, X billions. And I said, I'm going to fight, I want it, yeah. and we'll do it. Mm. And Doug has been with me for 18 years. He's, 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 he's our CFO. He's worked with me since 2006. And it's those small things in life when you come across an ambitious chartered accountant who says to you, I'm going nowhere. I'm following you. Mm. When we left Optimum, Doug Gain said to me, Mike, I'm, not, I'm on your coattails. Mm. I believe in your dream. I'm following you. And mm. it's 2023 now, we're 18 years. He's the CFO of Seriti, and this is a multi. This paper. <laughs> <laughs> and those are. <laughs> no, the point, no, the point I'm making is that these are the people I'd like you, as young people, to have other people believing in you, mm. not believing in yourself. In other words, the young people who can carry the hopes of others. You don't do those things. And that's basically how I was raised. Mm. I mean, you, you had a very successful corporate career. And you may find, I think, many of our audience, and if you're listening online or watching online, please post your questions and we'll direct them to Mr. Tege. Also, our in-house audience, please come up with some questions. We're going to have a dialogue at the end. But where a lot of young people find themselves is they find themselves in that cozy corporate environment, you've got your qualifications, you're rising up the corporate ladder, and it's comfortable. How then do you transition from that comfort to the challenging and dis often discomfortable world of entrepreneurship, and how was that journey for you in particular? Well, firstly, what do you want in life? There are people who would want a career where they will go up to 65, and after 65, they worry about preparing their will, uh, start to put together the policies, yeah. and make sure that the funeral policy is paid. You know. No, 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 but it's serious, right? True, you worry true, about true. those things yeah. at that age. Then there are people who want to a job. They just want a job. You know, they execute the paper that comes past. You put a stamp, you know, it's the job. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. For me, it's the hunger of people walking around, restless. You know, in 2004, there was a conversation going around where I worked. I worked at BHP Billiton. And there was a big conversation about BEE, you know, that we need to sell assets and all that. And the question I used to ask is, if people in your organization are starting to look outside, what's wrong with me? Why don't you sell these assets to me? I know them, I've worked with them. Yeah. I started in coal mining the same probably time with somebody in this room. <laughs> Honestly, we know what has happened. If you asked me about any mine, probably you woke me up at 2 a.m. I'll probably tell you about that mine, right? It's the experience that we've gathered working in these corporates. And I'm saying to the young person who is in that environment, Look around, what is it that's going to make you happy? What's going to make you feel like that aha moment? And for me, that's what I've always looked for. I've, I don't have connections. I don't have, as in, when I say connections, you know in the past you used to be asked, who do you know where? Yeah. You know, Mark Kudifani, the CEO of Anglo-American, said to me, I'm interested in talking to you because we have interacted in the Chamber of Mines, now the Minerals Council, and I'm interested in understanding how you can turn A, B, C, D around because you think, I think you can do it. That's when people start to believe in you. Yeah. Now, that's where I'm saying when you are inside that corporate and as a young person, if you have a corporate career and you want to retire and look after your pension, there's nothing wrong. It's fine. Do it. 
that's how your epitaph will be read, right? Yeah. Everybody will read your obituary and say, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are restless. Yeah. And for me, I have that restlessness in me. I am a very restless human being. Yeah. You talk about, in the book, uh, people who inspired you through their leadership. And there's a couple of individuals uh, that you mentioned, but there's two that stood out for me. Uh, your former principal, who later became your boss, and then your, your boss, I think it was at BHP Billiton, who saw the entrepreneurial spark in you. Sure. Can you talk about those two individuals so, and maybe expand on others? Yeah, I've, I've written about several people. Mr. Vusi Debes was the principal at high school, and the school was not far from my home, and he used to call me and sit with me, and all the time he used to really hammer things in me about attitude. He said he liked my attitude, and he understood that I didn't come from a great family. That is the way I dressed and the like. I didn't like fashionable clothes and the like. Yeah. And he used to say to me every day, and for some reason, I'm sure I mentioned it in the book, he used to call people Mazambani, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he knows your name, but he will call you that, right? Yeah. And he used to drill in me, and at times, I had this thing of when I see his car, he used to drive a maroon Mercedes Benz. It's like I would run away from him, you understand? Yeah. But he just used to come, 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 come. Yeah. Listen, one, two, three, four. Every day it was like that drill. And I fell in love with his attitude, his spirit. And truth be told, I used to ask myself that question. Why does this man love me? And then when I started, when I finished, I was supposed to go and start at Unilever, by the way, in 1990 in Durban at a place called Hudson and Knight. And I didn't, and I started looking for a job in Joburg. He's the one who said, come, come. You must wow. come and work here. Wow. And for a year, I worked for him. He mm. was a principal, and he would chase me all the time. <laughs> you must dress properly. You know the tie. Yeah. He wanted me to be a gentleman. Yeah. Then the second person is a gentleman called Philip Hechter. He was the chief operating officer at BHP Billiton in Manganese business. And uh, he as well. There are people in your life, guys, and don't kick them out. There are those people who will be difficult towards you. Their attitude will be strangers, strange, but they will fall in love with you. But you, nobody will tell you that this guy likes you. There's no one who will tell you that. Philip liked me. Philip liked me. He was Africans, spoke proper English, a towering figure, and he used to sit with me and used to say to me, you are arrogant, <laughs> you're full of this uh, S name, yeah. and I want to tell you something. Yeah. I've watched you, you can see around the corners. Because yeah. I used to talk about business, and I used to follow. I've got things that I've written that I keep with me, and I used to be noisy, and I used to say, you see around the corners. You must go and start your own business. Wow. You will be successful. And I said, gee, I'm scared. And when you trapped, in a corporate life, you're trapped by golden handcuffs. You worry about your 13th check. You've got a house, you've got children at a private school. Yep. You've got those share options. They are not vesting you. Right? <laughs> you left with month, nine months, and you don't want to disturb you. Do you understand? Yeah, and yeah. You, so they are, those handcuffs are serious. Yes, sir. They, they, you stuck with them. Mm. And this is the person who said to me, my friend, you're making a mistake. In 2004, mm. a lot of people don't know, I was supposed to go to Singapore. The person who wrote the foreword to this book is Dr. Marius Klopas. He wanted me to go with him to Singapore. And Philip called me to his house on a Saturday in Van der Bale Park, and he said to me, Mike, the party is here. Yeah. You're going to the wrong place. Wow. The party is here. Stay wow. here. Mm. Start your own thing. Yeah. And he used to say that I can come across as unethical because I'm your boss. It's like I'm kicking you out or I'm working against this business because you are a talented person. But go and do your thing. Mm. And he gave me that courage. But yeah. nobody ever told me that this guy likes you. Wow. I was, I was listening to a, an interview with uh, Aligo Dangot, and um, he said at one point uh, when he made it big into the billions, and you could see the figures on paper, but he couldn't believe it. And he wrote, <laughs> he wrote himself a, 
a $10 million check. And he went to the bank and he cashed it. And he took the bags of money, <laughs> he put it in his boot, he went home and he spent the night just looking at the money. And he said, okay, now I believe that I've got this money. And you know, at some point, you, you, you used to earn 76 rand per week no? yes. at the factory. Yes. Did you have an Aliko Dangote moment at some point? <laughs> you, know, you know, when I was growing up in Guatemala, and I was walking from Fred Habed in the afternoon, the sun is hot. In the back. There was a red car in Guatemala, and a Ro Alfa Romeo, Julieta. Oh, those years. I don't know, I know the streets in Guatemala, Cataza Street, they used to park this red car. And I used to see cars, but this is the car I used to watch and say, something about this car. And when I grow up one day, must have a red car. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was your good good to move. No, honestly, I used to stand there and marvel this car. Yeah. And say, this car is beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> you got it. No, I don't know. I just... <laughs> no, honestly, okay, let me say, truth be told, yeah. I've never been into money things. Okay. Honestly, I've never worried about wealth as in. I want to talk to people about money and yes, the like. Sir. The best thing I do with money, mm. I like something with money. I share it. Wow. A lot of people know I do yeah. share it. I like to, I like to look for small opportunities. Mm. The things that make me happy are things like when you give somebody something, not because they are poor. No, no, no. It makes you feel good when you stand in front of the mirror that I am able to give somebody a rent mm. and still feel good. Yeah. I'm not bankrupt. Mm. Actually, it comes in, in multiples. Yeah. That's my Dangote movement. That's beautiful. Yeah. Just on that, what are the things that you want to change in the world or in South Africa or in Africa? One of the big things that I'd like to change, number one, for me, it's young people, I think we're not doing enough to take young people by the hand and guide them and help them through life. That's number one for me. Number two, it's the legacy of people are poor, you know, people are hungry. And at times, there are people where I tend to watch it and I drive with several people and I say it all the time when I go to the mines. And I, when I meet somebody, and you say, but why would the world be so unfair to this person? Yeah. Why? What happened? Mm. What happened to this journey? Mm. You meet a guy who's standing at a shop and he's asking for money. Have you ever asked yourself, but why? Mm. And I, 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 I watch those things and I want to change them. It's just that we don't publicize these things. There's a young girl, I won't mention her name. She comes from Guatemala. She's finishing her degree to be a medical doctor. And when I sat with her, I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to be a specialist one day. I want to be a medical doctor. And I said, let's take that journey. Let's see. And the journey is ending this year. The point I'm making is that you will come across these people who come across us, but what happened? And it's that change that I want to make. And the, la the last big thing for me, I'm worried about our country. Because when you travel overseas, I see how other countries grow. You know, I was in Singapore in March. That country hums. You know, it's humming. Mm. You know, guys, I watch you as South Africans, and I'm going to tell you a painful story. I went to Singapore. Last week I was in Switzerland. And I look at these countries and I say to myself, my God, one thing about us as South Africans, we are poor travelers. I'm sorry, guys, you can quote me. It's fine. <laughs> what I mean, you won't survive in another country. Right? 
You won't survive in any neighboring country, any country. Not be, I'm not saying anything about those countries. I'm saying you, as, as one of us, we are citizens of this country. And I'm saying if we were to break this country and destroy it, where would we go? Where would you go? And that's my dream. My dream is I don't want to be a politician. I'm not going to take anybody's job. I'm not going to stand at the podium and wear a T-shirt. I won't. But my dream is, together with Professor Khatdebe, Mr. Khatle here, these are the people with deep pockets. We need to change this country. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, ladies and gents, when you go to countries like you walk in Geneva in Switzerland, you say, my Lord, if we can get our country mm. back to just to be what it is. That's my dream. Oh, can I give that a round of applause? Um, in the book, you talk about mentorship quite a bit. And um, before this conversation, there was another conversation, and you took about a group of young people that you mentored. Yes, yes. We have also published a, a book. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, so what happened is that I come across people who would say, Mike, can you mentor me? Can you guide me? And you guys come in different personalities. There are those people who take mentorship seriously. Yeah. So what I mean by, those, by that is I've got young people who irritate you in a positive way. They phone you, they make the appointment. What time can I see you? Can I be there at seven o'clock? Can I? They are religious about it. And there's this diligence and you help them and you guide them and I've seen them grow. There's one young guy I invited today. He couldn't come because he's so busy now, right? He's running proper businesses. He is troublesome. He mm. troubles me. <laughs> then you come across those who have a dream. They've heard about mentorship. And uh, can I come and see you? And they see you once. And once you tell them the truth, they run away. <laughs> so I found myself with a group of around 18, 19 of these kids. When I say kids, 20, 30, they're bright people. And I said to them, why don't you write a chapter? Tell a story in a chapter of anything that you want to talk about on leadership and the like. And we, pro we published this book called This Generation Leads. And it's 19 of these kids who came, they, they wrote whatever they wanted to write. Most of them are great, they're successful. I think of those, maybe nine good entrepreneurs. I'm talking about entrepreneurs, people who built things, they are successful. I won't mention their names. If I mention their names, probably they'll, they'll sue me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but reality is I love mentoring people, but I want you to be serious. I yeah. can't walk with you on this journey and as you're busy looking around at other things. Yes. I want you to focus on the journey. And I mentor, I, I make the time, if you are available at 7 a.m. I've got a person I mentor, Leighton can tell you, Monday morning, seven o'clock, he's in my office. Wow. He's, made, he's committed to that, I want, I'm not going away. Mm. And at times, do I feel irritated? No, I don't. I see he'll put it in my diary, seven o'clock is there. Tuesday morning, there's another one. I make that time, at least six, seven, I'm still, I've read my emails, I've done things from home, and by the time I arrive at the office, everything is fine. If I'm going to the mines, there are those who want to go with me to the mines, but reality of the matter, yes, I love mentoring these young people. Wonderful. What are the dynamics that make a good mentee and mentor relationship work both, because you've been on both, both ends? From the mentor side, what is required and what makes the relationship work, and from the mentee side? So from, from the mentor's side, it's time, right? You're investing time in something that's valuable. Recognize that. Don't tell people that I don't have time. You'll make time, that's number one. Number two, I've always been able to tell people that let's first time, first few sessions, two, three discussions, what does success look like? What do you want to be? What do you want to achieve in life? And we spend time on talking about that. And the third big one, it's for me, I would always say to people, there are boundaries, but our conversation is going to be boundaryless. I'm going to end up talking to you about, I'll give you an example. I know of a young man, and uh, you'll meet one, some, some of these youngsters, one of them, some of them are in the book, where I know that there is an element of wasting time on things that they should not be wasting time on. And he loves certain things that I have a problem with. 
and I share those things, and they become too personal. So as a mentor, you're going to cross boundaries and find that some things you say are so offensive, you've offended, but you're building yeah. this young person. Mm. From a mentee's side, for me, it's one way to focus. Do you want to be focused on what I tell you and share with you? Or are you coming because, oh, I wanted to meet Mike, you know? And you get disappointed because some of the people who want to meet me, they see me maybe on television. When they meet me, they meet the short guys. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was a tall guy. <laughs> so a mentee for me is about focus. Are you focused? Do you want to achieve what you want to achieve? Because I don't have time to waste as well. Yeah. So for me, it's that time thing, the ability to say, what does success look like? Why do you do this? What do you want me to do for you? Wow. You're somebody who's obviously very busy, successful, and the, the concept of work-life balance. You're a family man as well. How do you do, you do work-life balance, or do you find that Sometimes this side is falling, sometimes this side is falling. How are those dynamics working? So I used to tell people the story that there are scams in the world. Mm. One of those scams is work-life balance. So I, used to, <laughs> I used to say that. And uh, because people have a problem of when you start talking about work-life balance, then, then people justify the effect that I must come to work at 8 o'clock and at 4 o'clock I must leave. I'm going to the gym or I'm going somewhere you lose it, you lose it. Work-life balance is critical. It is important, it is core to our lives. One, make sure that your time is your time. I, I respect that. I wake up very early. If you want to catch me, catch me at quarter to four. We can talk, half past three, quarter to four, four, we can talk. I'm alert, I'm doing something. I'm in the gym or something. If I go to the office, I make sure that I'm balanced. When I come back home, I listen and have a conversation with my wife. I listen, I listen, I listen. It's things that I've learned. It's not things that I was born with as if I'm an expert. No, that's balancing that life. Yes, but the biggest regret in my life, one, I regret that I never took advantage of the opportunity to drive my kids to school. Never. And uh, when now I wake up, my children are finished at school, yeah. I notice that there's a bond, a very strong bond, and a language between my wife and, her, and the kids, yeah. which I'm not part of. <laughs> You're not part of that cycle. <laughs> because these guys used to travel together in the car, wow. back in school, everything. They know each other. They know what they talk about. You not. You are an outsider. Mm. Don't miss that opportunity. Oh. I missed it. <laughs> the third big thing, people talk about health, ladies and gents. I haven't, the discussion that Steve Jobs talks, talked about in the past, there's a conversation which I amplify to people that when you go and do blood tests, you know, you can have a butler at home, you can have a chauffeur, you can have a security guard, you have a driver, you can have anything, a chef at home. The day the doctor wants blood tests, he wants them from you. You can't send any of those people. It's you. Oh, powerful. I went to hospital to visit a friend who passed away because of cancer. And it's somebody I love dearly. And uh, when he was lying there, that's where you notice that you're on your own. People visit you because they have nothing to do that afternoon or the match has just finished, Orlando Pirates has just beaten. Thank you. <laughs> and you say, ah, let me go to this hospital and see this person. <laughs> Don't ever think that maybe, oh yeah, people will come and visit you on your own. Mm. So your health, yep. your health. So one, if your doctor says, I want blood tests, you can't send anybody. Two, when you're lying on that hospital bed, you are alone. And there's something I've learned over the years. Your bloods don't lie. Blood will never lie. If the doctor says you've got this condition, you've got it. So make sure that you look after yourselves. And that's where like, what life balance comes in. Yeah. Watch those things. What you do in the morning when you wake up, 
you go to work and make sure that there are conversations that happen healthily at home. I've always, I've never in my career and in my life, even now, where I have the opportunity to do what I want, I will never ever leave my office and go anywhere else. I go home. Mm. Yeah, like if I have an engagement, I'll do that. But if I go home because there's somebody I've left there who's been with me for 31 years. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Uh, you've mentioned the, the mighty Orlando Pirates, Amabaganea. And that, that brings us to the topic of soccer. Uh, you are, I know you're an <laughs> avid soccer lover. There's a rumor yes. that the corporate world almost lost you to soccer. Yes. Because you were just that good. So people don't believe that. Right? <laughs> Anybody who comes from Guatemala with my age group will believe it. Yeah. But Kikatle doesn't believe it. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I played football. Amazing football. Wow. A lot of people used to say that. Right? <laughs> and uh, when I was growing up, a lot of people used to say, you must go and play professional football. You're going to make a good profit. In fact, during COVID, I used to get bored. Uh, and I used to play soccer, and, and I took a video. And yeah. I sent it to a friend, and this friend put it on social media. Yeah. And I got a call from Bruce Whitfield one evening. and said, Mike, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, I did. Mm. I played football. And when I was at university, I decided to play football. And I didn't know that there were people who were scouting for football players from Mahuele Ring Mother Wells in Mahuele Ring or something. Yeah. And I went to play football and I told my sister, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to play professional football. And my sister said, it stops now and here. No yeah. more. Wow. Stop, finish school, no more soccer. Mm. And I went back to Guatemala. I told her the story that I think I can make a good profit. And he said to me, no. Mm. No football. Yeah. You finish school, you complete your school, and go and work. No soccer. Yeah. And my sister, today, I, 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 I kiss her for that. <laughs> Honestly. I do. Wonderful. Yeah. But I did, and I think a lot of people who, on a serious note, who, were, who raised me in Guatemala, they still talk about that. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I think we've got a few questions from online and please get ready in the house as well uh, from Tsepo uh, does one's personality influence how one becomes collegial so is, 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 is are some people innately collegial or is it a personality thing I think it's something that we learn it's a skill that we learn but there are people who are born with it but I'm saying the transition that you come up with, it's the transition where you know yourself that you're not. You know, you're this bully, you're noisy, you push people and the like. It's the conscious effort that you, take, you make to say, I think what is good for me, what's going to make the world a better place is for me to behave in this particular manner. You learn those skills. You teach. You. I taught myself a lot of things. Let me tell you one of the skills that I'm bad at, terrible, I was not a good listener. I'm not a good listener. I was born like that. I'm not a good listener. Every time people speak, I will interject. But over the years, because I can talk to this guy in the mirror, you know? Yeah. I can talk to the guy in the mirror and say, just listen, listen. Mm. And every time I'll whisper this in me and say, Mike, just listen. Yeah. And I've learned to listen. I was honest doing the research. You said something on the same topic, which I loved. He said, we have two ears. One mouth. One mouth. And that and should tell us say. something. Yeah, yeah. That's what they say, those people in the classics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, question from uh, Mishek Matomo. Can you share an example of a situation where you took a calculated risk to grow as a leader, and for some reason the calculation was not good enough and it backfired, and how do you deal with it? I am trying to think, yes, there was a risk that I took in one sector of the economy at the behest of some clever regulator who said to me, I'd like you to invest in this business. You can help us grow this business. And I think the error on my side was it was an industry. It, I chose a wrong business. And do I regret it? No. It was school fees for me. 
uh, I learned a good lesson, and I did bend my fingers in that. Why? Because I thought it's still a thriving industry. It's a big industry, but it was just a mistake. Wow. Yeah. The world at the moment, earlier um, we were talking about you know, the environmentalist and um, the issue of decarbonization. <laughs> and the world seems to be going left, but you're going in the opposite direction. You're investing even more in, in your particular business. Can you talk to us about, about that and what you think of decarbonization and the whole energy mix? And so okay. So let's start talking about the whole decarbonization concept, a story. Decarbonization means obviously emitting less carbon or going to net zero. Yes. Two, the whole story about climate change for me, it's real. Scientists have proved that. I don't want to dispute that. Okay? I'm not arguing with science. Decarbonization is real. It's fact. It's there. It's the way we're traveling this journey, one, that we are 54 countries in Africa. We are developing economies. The Western people call us developing economies. They call us underdeveloped economies. When we cause problems, they say we are failed states. They, all those things happen in this continent. This continent has a population almost the size of India and China. There are almost half a billion people in this continent, right, who probably don't have access to electricity, access to basic things like making food in a decent manner. South Africa so happens to be having a decent grid in terms of power, electricity, or energy, let's say energy. And we have 16 coal-fired power stations, 1616. Are you saying to me now, today, that shut this 16 coal-fired power station? Today, I've got an installed capacity of 50 gigawatts. Coal plays a predominant role in that. Are you saying I must switch them off because I'm a carbon, I'm a, I'm a carbon emitter? What do I do? You are saying to me, no, 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 build nuclear, build renewables, wind, solar, and the like. I cannot switch those things and build this. Yeah. I'm saying it's a journey that yeah. I'm going to travel. Mm. Let's build renewables, as in wind turbines. I'm not against it. I'm an investor. I just spend a billion rand in building a company that's going to build 111 wind turbines in Mpumalanga. Two. We are invested in businesses that supply solar panels. We believe in solar. Yeah. We are not against it. But as this grows, this business of renewables, the ability to make sure that it's reliable, it's dependable, and it's not going to be intermittent over a period of time, then we will slowly win ourselves yeah. off fossil fuels. But fossil fuels will still be here for the coming 40, 50 years. That is why I'm still investing in that. Yeah. The 15 coal-fired power stations that are located wherever they are located, around them there are mines that feed them with coal to burn and produce that energy and so that the electrons can come through the grid. There are human beings in those communities who live in those communities, who, yep. live, who depend on those jobs. Mm. And don't ever argue with me and say, Mike, those things are killing them, right? I understand that there are health issues that come with it. The cars that are on the road here, they emit a lot. People, people want to live, people want to develop, people want to grow. But let's not kill our continent by speedily saying we'll close this thing whilst we're not perfect on this one. If we can master the art of renewables. Right now, we are load shedded. We are stage four today. And we have coal, 15 coal, 16 coal-fired power stations, 16 burning. If you shut them, what would load shedding be? If we don't have an elaborate renewable strategy and renewable infrastructure that's already established. That's my dream. I am not an environmental denialist. I am not a fossil as in dinosaur. <laughs> I am not against climate change. I'm not one to sit in front of television and say, 
Kimudivo, that is why it's raining like that. <laughs> I understand science, and we have to decarbonize. Yeah. But it's a journey that we must responsibly traverse. Yeah. If Germany has a problem with its electricity, it's easy, and I might be wrong, it's easy for them to tap on France next door, who've got nuclear, and they can import power. Where do I import power from the SADC region? Tell me. I've got 1,000 megawatts I'm getting from Kahora Basa. In 1971, go and read this. 1971, the Grand Inga was supposed to be developed. It was going to be a, something like 40, 40 gigawatts of power coming from hydro. It's 2023. Nothing has been done. And you come to me and say, I'll dictate to you that I want you to live your life this way. Doesn't That's happen. my dream. Wonderful. <laughs> we'll take questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, I think it's... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get another one. Oh, it's not the oh, there thank you. you. Oh, please, please stand up and pose your questions. Sir. Yes, thank you. Yeah. My name is Lucky Khatli, so as Mike said, um, let me start by first acknowledging Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it would be remiss of me not to do that. So I, I want to acknowledge your brotherhood, your friendship, those four, uh, four o'clock in the morning calls, <laughs> five o'clock in the morning calls that he's talking about. I bothered him with a lot of that. And him and I will have conversations early in the morning while people are still sleeping. So yes. thank you for that. And Thanks. Those are the type of mentorship that actually ultimately has impact into the society. Mike, I, I want to, and we talked a number of topics, you and I. I mean, we can pretty much spend the whole day talking about it. But one of the things which you touched on today is the whole concept about grit. And I remember one of the conversations that we'll have Actually, this was not 4 o'clock in the morning. It was around in your office. We talked about tea fortitude. I won't mention the word tea. Yeah, no, what I'll, it is. I'll, I'll tell the boys. <laughs> yeah, you'll tell the boys. <laughs> yeah. And we talked about this concept for me and as well comes to the whole issue about grit. And the youth that we are sort of cultivating for becoming future leaders. And you talked about that, the importance of grit and making sure that at that attitude, we nurture it early on so that when they get to face tough situations, they have to lead. And I mean, everything rises and falls with leadership to the point that you're making in the book. And I wonder whether there is enough done by us, whether it's Higher Learning uh, Institute of Learnings or it's in the corporate development programs that we infuse that type of a skill because I, I want to classify it as a skill. You know, it's a skill that you can be taught. Yes, you mentioned earlier on in your school times there was a principal that was a mentor to you that infused that, used to challenge you. Maybe you hated that type of discussions, but we need to find a way, whether it's corporate development programs or it's Institute of Higher Learning, we need to find a way to do that. That's at a point of leadership development. The second part I would like you to also comment on, you talked about country leadership level. And you made an example about Singapore, which I really like that model in the way that they have developed a country that's not endowed with a lot of mineral resources, right? They're not, but they are very successful in what they've done. And for me, there are three principles that I look at how they've done it. One of them, you just spoke about it, or it, you demonstrated it, pragmatism. When the country is faced with challenges, we can't just say, let's adopt a model of just moving from coal to renewables. We have to be pragmatic about the solutions that we develop. And one of the things, if you look at Singapore, that stands out for me, meritocracy, pragmatism, ethical leadership. Those three principles, if you look at South Africa today, 
maybe you can even touch on meritocracy and look at are we putting the right people in the roles to lead in the concept that you talk about in your book. And I'm just, I'm still going to read the book, sure. but I've had the summary of it in your discussion today. And it, it really touches me because those are things that I believe are needed for us to make our country that we love all of us. I'm sure many of you that are here today love this country. I don't have a second passport. There's only one passport I've got. Green Mamba. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to make it work. But these are the things that I'll, I'll like you to just comment on the meritocracy, pragmatism you've already demonstrated in that example of decarbonization. Because he asked you a question, and the response is exactly that, that we don't just da jump to a model prescribed by somewhere else. And whether it works here or it doesn't work, we just say, no, we'll adopt it. And the issue about ethical leadership in the context of your book around collegiality, because for me, that collegiality talks to cooperation, talks to companionship, talks to all those words that are comes to as synonyms. I just wanted to talk about those sure. points at corporate level and also the country level within those principles of meritocracy, pragmatism, and ethical leadership. You know, the first important thing, like here, I, I use that word, and I won't mention it here because I'll get into trouble, fortitude. And uh, uh, Professor Khatebe met Peter Amitage. So in 2013, Peter Amitage came to see me and he said to me, Mike, we need to build an asset manager. But the asset manager we need to build, I want it to be black. I want it to have the blackness in it. And you, the person who must travel this journey. And, and I said to him, explain to me, what, are the, what does the big picture look like? And he said to me, if we can cross 100 billion rand of assets under management, then we go. Nothing will stop us. So I went to visit him at his house one Saturday as we were starting, and he said to me, yeah, you, you know, I could, I could see that he was feeling irritated with me because he had sparked this fire in me that we go now. It's a go. You, you provoked me. Let's do it. And he brought in the money and the team. And today, Anchor Capital was 120 billion assets under management. It's that grit. It's that grit that a person like Peter pushing and saying, we need to do this. What is the difference? The difference is the young generation that we see today. It's young people who would say, there are no opportunities. There's nothing happening. There's, I can't find this. I can't find that. But weekends, I know what you're busy with, right? <laughs> the second big thing, uh, meritocracy for me is, you know, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to criticize me for this. I look at the things that fall apart in a place, right? I look at things that fall apart. If you were raised in a home, let's say you were raised in a township or village or rural area, and in your home, things are falling apart. The gate is falling apart. There's always litter outside. And you live in that house. I don't think you take pride in being in that part of that. Not unless something is wrong with your value system. So if you were raised in an environment where things must be orderly, things must be clean, no litter, nobody, a piece of paper goes into a dustbin, even if you don't have money, but your dignity must show that at least you are clean. Then you grow up. When you take a role in a corporate or in government, I'm telling you those values follow you. You know, you, you operate with those standards. And I'm finding that some of the, the businesses, that some of the organizations that are falling apart today, I think it's people who I don't think take pride in building things that are beautiful. And you write, uh, like when you drive in Singapore, you stand on the road next to the traffic light. You look dumb if you were to cross the traffic light red. They, 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 they frown at you. What is this guy doing? You wait. But there are no cars, right? Until it becomes green, you cross. It's because you have dignity. It's because you respect yourself. I don't think when you sleep at night, you go into your bed with shoes on, right? <laughs> Very uncomfortable. So why do we do all these strange things? Meritocracy for me, it's a big story. The third big thing, it's ethical leadership. 
and I touched on the issue that when we do transactions, you do come across painful moments when people cross the line and do things. And that is why I made a comment earlier about articles which were written. It's people who will distract you. Life will distract you. And there's this conversation, I don't know whether who said it, it's not me, that if you are a postman delivering post, you're working delivering post, and dogs bark at you, you don't get off your bicycle and go down on your knees and bark back at the dogs, right? Yeah. Because you won't deliver the post. <laughs> yeah. You continue to deliver post. So but the, for me, those people were proverbial dogs that were making noise on the journey. And for me, it's that fortitude. And if there's a boy here or a man who wants to know the first word of fortitude, I'll whisper it in your ear. It will help you. That's the medication that will help you, that we've got to be ethical. Meritocracy for me is number one. And it has nothing to do with whether you got eight A's at metric. No. No, it has nothing to do. It's your ability. Come to my office and ask. Leighton is here. My desk, there's no paper on my desk. I don't want paper. I hate paper. Get paper, I read it, I tear it, I throw it in the dustbin. There's no paper. It's the discipline, it's those small things. And I mentioned it in my next book that my grandmother was building me to probably to be a five-star army general. <laughs> I think that's what she was doing. <laughs> and I've learned to believe in those things. And like he's right, we used to, when I'm on the treadmill, I'm wearing my head, ear pods, I used to talk to like he at four and five <laughs> in the morning. Wow, amazing. Uh, Thank you. We'll take one from the back there. Yeah. Th thanks very much, uh, and thanks for that presentation, Mark. And I think some of the things that you mentioned there, uh, are, I'm actually the witness, one, in terms of the giving. Uh, I know how does your checkbook look like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, around the, you know, the, 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 the complexion and all of that. I remember when I walked in at the first uh, NK Capital meeting, uh, one of the, my statements when I greeted you was like, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for me, what, what I wanted to check, for the sense, in terms of the, the fundamentals, is to say, what, what are some of the values, I mean, that had, have helped you in terms of managing the collegiality, I mean, with all the colleagues that you've mentioned, I mean, Peter Art, uh, Armitage being one of them, your, your Zungu being one of them, Abu Mamu Ana being one of them, and what are some of the values that will help you to ensure that you, you drive that collegiality and not just drive it, but to also ensure that it's maintained for the greater benefit of the society? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You know, the first important thing that I was taught, obviously, because I was raised by this grandmother called Dorothea, that is why the company is called, the company that owns shares in Sirit, it's called Lady Dorothea. It's, it's Massimo, Massimo is owned by Lady Dorothea. Dorothea is my grandmother, the one who gave me, gave me the name Solomon. <laughs> uh, one, it's respect. You know, I, I've tried my best to stay respectful. I've tried my best to stay humble. I must tell you a story that there are times where it's true that power corrupts and absolute power, you know, you become corrupt when you're powerful. And I'm proud of something that I'm feel strong, I'm, I feel strong and grounded about. It's the respect my grandmother taught me. You know, I'm good at being able to control certain things. You won't see me doing certain, there are things I don't do. And I won't mention them, there are things I don't do. Because I still believe that my North Star, that guardian angel, my grandmother still sees that. The second thing is, I, and I, I don't take it as if I'm arrogant, it's just out of humility that I'm a hard worker, I work hard. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I work hard, I finish my assignments, I, I write at night, I wake up in the morning, and something that I'm grateful for is that my health has responded positively, thanks God. I don't know what would happen tomorrow, but my health has responded positively. So hard work, respect, and the last big thing is just that humility. Yeah. You know, I've never gone around and started 
I don't like talking about money. You know, I just, I find it, it's just not comfortable. But just that respect, it will take you places. Wonderful. Uh, so we're going to rotate, we went to the back. Now, we can, oh yeah, let's, the gentleman, the white. Okay. Yeah. Babu say I bong a little Nadiganga no Babu Tete. O Yaskutas at Tinis Buyelok Shim. O Buyagas. Buyagatema, Ben Simmons at Tema, a Gulonyaga got a Asian bonus into his intiglianda. O go to Buyelok Shin, Yaskutas at Tin, and we so it. Gay outer set of Sinfield. You come across to me when I Babu Tete sang at Number one, Angaz Guti Ubungenwe Yini Uguti Uzbonu Tisha Ufundi Sunyago Oda Uye Gubau Tishungene in the boardroom. If I were to be your biographer, I will say for the, from the classroom to the boardroom. Goba Uya Tu Sababute Utata in Yata Luzinzim. You come across to me as someone that knows how to make the right choice at the right time for the right purpose. <laughs> 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 well, uh, so, whilst many people be sabu tata the leap of faith, nambulo tisha ushale skole ni minyag. When many of us are very comfortable in our spaces, even though how comfortable they can be. How did you know it was the right move? For you to move and transition from being Utisha to be the corporate leader that you are. That's number one. August Billy, Gina 48. Gizamila with department Yom Shato twice in Gashuleg. It was Silo Kalanati for Sogas Bill and Gashuleg at forty eight. Hey, Nango Babu de Uts Nam Sanje Gimi Utimaga Pume of his seen Uyeka. Now for thirty one years, Babu de. Now, Buzo, I'm Uti Minam Shulei. Now, the second principle that I'm learning, Lana Guti, sang out to Babute when you are to Keta, even Nabantaba, right? So, finally, you shut it now. Babantalu sees us legged. I'm cool, Miss Long as Pesul and Jenna Bantaba Fundi, Labacona, Lagota, Minangiti, Jenny and Sis and Mania Sesso, which I won't legged. Uguti gimas ganja and lungosaza and uguti uyena wangembela yin. So that git masang puma gule kampanya na ya mengi fusile give a sun and get straight a car. Umzi wagam goma gitaluting hot on a lama car. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things about the teaching profession, the teaching profession is labeled in the right way. It's a noble profession. Teaching is a noble, noble profession. It's a serious profession. It's not a joke. You know, if you are a teacher, give it your all, your heart and everything. If I wanted to be a teacher, I would have probably done what Professor Khatebe has done, you know, end up being a professor. Because it's such a deep, deep profession. And I felt at the time that knocking off at 2 o'clock, marking the boobs, this needs proper, proper dedication. And my restlessness, Babungoma, that's the one that made me search for what I was searching for. And I left. I'm not one who said, I want to leave teaching because it doesn't pay, no. That profession is noble. It needs somebody who wakes up, who eats, who lives, who walks, who's... Teachers are teachers. 
they are, they are the ones who make us who we are. Mr. Tevesa was like that. He stayed at school for a long time. In the evening when you walked out, the light in the office was still on. The park, Mercedes-Benz was parked outside. He was busy because that was the teacher I related to. But I felt myself that, you know, this level of dedication is different for me. I'm in another world. Let me go and do this. Professor Marwala at UJ, he's left now, he's the rector and, and principal of the University of the United Nations. That's the man who, tell, who shows you what a teacher is. That's a, that's a teacher. And therefore, for me, I noticed that I am restless, I'm going to do other things, I'm not paying attention to this, let me move into something else, and I found what I found. And the other important thing, don't underestimate that you make your luck, you know. You become lucky. You become lucky. The second big, big thing you're talking about is marriage. And you'll <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I have it, my grandmother maybe inculcated a strange thing. It's that loyalty to that person who taught the things you know, right? And I've been there for 30 something years now. And when I live here now, what goes through my mind is that person. And uh, I have the capacity. Other people may mislead you and say, but you have the capacity to do this. In other words, you can go to anywhere you want. That's not true. That's not true. The person who saw me crying the first time when I was negotiating with my credit card, she was my girlfriend. So why should I go away from her now when I no more talk about credit cards? Why? Why? What's so special out there? I love that. I love that. Let's, yeah, let's give the lady a chance. Is this mic? Oh, yeah, it's, it's on. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is um, Dudu Zilesbergo, and um, I'm a doctor, but in health in the mining sector. And I got a shock of my life. I mean, I started working at the age of 40 before I was a businesswoman, and um, corporate was shocking for me. And, and the reason I stand is because collegiality, I, I started to hear you talk about this on a YouTube clip with Dudum Somi, and, and I thought, I want this book. Where can I get it? Because I can relate to the things that you, especially us in mining, the words S and kicking and it's our daily bread. And have, having come from the medical background, you, you think you've got grit, you know, because you've seen it all. But the level of the safeties and the fatalities that we go through Gosh, I've never been in such a high-pressured environment in my life. And then there's these things that we write, the values and, and things that we do for the JSE to look good, you know, carbon efficient and, you know, the, the lies. Okay, it's not really lies, but, you know, we have to comply. <laughs> but part of it is that it's this concept of women in mining or women in leadership. It's the concept of diversity. And we talk about it. We have safety values, diversity, inclusivity moments. But I think none of us truly understand that so that we can embrace it into our culture, our corporate culture or whatever businesses that we're in. And, and that's where maybe my question is going to be centered, that... As women, or maybe people of different, you know, there's different types of diversity groups these days. Um, I think we, we have papers that have shown that companies that have got diversities do better. But I think the practicality, we talked about pragmatism, of that hasn't really manifested particularly in the, in the South African businesses. Um, women... How do we 
make our presence felt in the boardrooms. Um, our voices had, just as normal leaders, by the way, not because we're women, how do we navigate the dynamic of the boys' club? Um, because as a, as a mother, as a woman, there are certain limitations that you have in the sense that, you know, if you have to go to a meeting, for instance, at nine or, or a Saturday engagement, you still have kids to take care of at home. And that is a reality for most women that sometimes it's almost like you have to pretend to be a man as if you don't have kids or, you know, so that you can make it and pushing hard in this where you really have to give it your all. How do you navigate that? I'm very interested in those values. Okay. Thank you. So the first thing that I want to touch, the other point that I want to touch on, obviously I'm not perfect. I make my own mistakes, lots of mistakes. I, I, I trip over things. But one of the big things that I've stopped using years ago is the word diversity. I don't like that word. Diversity for me, it's a word that says we are a group of people, we drink together, and then we say, I, we don't look this, we all look the same, right? We're all wearing pants. And let's get somebody who wears a dress so that we are diverse. It's wrong, I don't like it. My view is the word that you mentioned later, inclusivity. Do our hearts allow us to be inclusive? in our conversation, in our behavior, in what we do, in how we eat, and all those things. Therefore, underground, when you go to a mine, you will relate when you see a team of men. Historically, I mentioned in that book when I talk about Fanaga law, everything was about my daughter, right, Lucky? Yeah, my daughter. It starts that way. Everything, that's how you address each other. When a man stood up underground to address you as a team, my daughter, you know, that's what it started with. It became a culture of exclusive club. It's an exclusive club of my daughters. In fact, in Fanaga law, that's what we talk about. There was a time when strikes were broken in industrial relations, when people don't believe in, as an example, a trade union, as an example, in a specific place, then they would say they'll elect 10 my daughters to go and talk with management. That was the language. Let me share with you Dr. Svebo, right? The game has changed. The young women underground who are mine overseers, mine captains, section managers, are amazing. I won't mention them here openly from Siriti because then you'll come and recruit from me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, somebody will phone the company next door to me and say, go and recruit them. The women who are underground are taking over. And it has changed our paradigm and our mindset because we believed them that they will be sec this, this lady must be a secretary in the office. The game is they wear PPE, proper PPE. They walk the same place. They do the things men do, and they speak the language. I'm talking about the language of mining as in delivery, lost time injuries, tonnages, costs. They, they talk the language. They are there. If you were to ask me for advice for women specifically, the mistake I believe women, by the way, in the mining industry, we've got two black female CEOs right now. Bumizigalala runs Kumba Iron Ore. Dr. Nomba Satsengo is running Exaro. So we've got black female CEOs, proper listed companies, and in the billions. The mistake some of the women make, it's my observation, and I'd like them to, it's when women want to walk like men. Figuratively and literally. I expect you to be, keep your femininity. You are a woman. Wear your, your, your nail polish. Wear your makeup. Remain a woman. Don't walk like us. It's not the standard. Be yourself, but be part, be included. Part of the collective, part of the group. It is happening. It is slow. It's not happening that quick but there are huge opportunities for women. But to say the industry is tough, yes, it is tough. It's a tough industry. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sure. Uh, hello. 
my name is Lishon Olohomu. Um, I'm an um, uh, engineering technician, civil engineering te technician right now. And I wanted to ask, in terms of uh, collegiality, uh, when you are in a position or when you're not in a position of authority, how can you use that in terms of teamwork where you're working with a team that is not as motivated as you are and you are trying to pass on the same performance that you are trying to push and also inspire the rest in, yeah, when you're not in that position of an authority and how to use that? That's, a, that's, that's an interesting question because in the book I talk about toxic people and toxicity, you know. And uh, people who don't have power or who are not in authority and they're part of teams, for me, the gospel that you spread is this gospel of a positive attitude, being able to participate in a collegial manner rather than being toxic because toxicity is the one that destroys things. There's a book written by Professor Coutier, and I mentioned him in the book where he talks about you, you become so stressed because being toxic, you end up, you, you, you're just an angry human being. Right? Anything is a rumor and you spread wrong messages. And even if you know that you're spreading untruths, you continue to spread them. But you know that what you're spreading is wrong and you're destroying a team. But people who are strong, who are performers, great performers, great attitude, and you don't have the power, it's your ability to spread the positive message, which I've always encouraged people to do, especially great performers. Don't keep quiet. And that's the message from my side. But if you continue to spread the things that you, you know very well that you're peddling a lie, but you continue it spreading and you're selling it. Wonderful. Young man. You save the best for last days. San Bonani. My name is Tatan Zulu. And uh, I have more of like a quest. Uh, more of it being a, um, yeah. So please just bear with me. I'm a bit nervous. Um, I had the gentleman here, Ubaba Ngapa, speaking on taking a leap, you know, and it really touches me because uh, it was a two and a half hours walk it took for me to get here, you know. Um, coming from UJ and as I'm walking and I'm about to reach here I recognize the the, the, the roaring sound of this engine you know um, I've read somewhere where it says your subconscious mind is more powerful than your mind there could be those little things that you know are happening around you and maybe you get to remember them later on but this engine, I realized that it's the engine that was roaring when I got this notebook at the Black Business Council. And it was a car waiting for Mr. Dege. <laughs> and I turned back, it's Mr. Dege inside the car. <laughs> and then he entered. Which and car? Entered. A, white, a white BMW. White BMW at X3. Okay. And the number plate starts with a K. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Teke, I started an initiative at, at UJ whereby we evaluate public policy. And ours is to, you know, deliver successful policy implementation. Um, and our main focus is improving the infrastructure of education in South Africa. So I completed a short course on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, passed with a distinction, 93% average. <laughs> and then, you know, one thing led to another, whereby on Monday, the ambassador uh, of Sweden to South Africa came to UJ, where uh, there was a general launch, and having been told that Sweden is leading in innovation in all over the world, and also I've researched on them in terms of implementing sustainable development goals. And they are leading in the, in the whole world. And my interest mostly lies in education because they have high literacy rates, especially tertiary education. You find that all the um, 
women in, in Sweden, especially in higher um, education institutions, have attained their degrees successfully within a period of four years. So I have a, a dream, actually, to go to Sweden and learn it more practically in terms of how they implement these SDGs, right? And I'm kindly requesting you, Mr. Tege, to enable this maybe crazy dream of mine yeah. to actually go and spend uh, two weeks yeah. and, uh, at you know, one of the universities in, 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 in Sweden and get to learn in terms of how they've localized the SDGs so that I can craft a model that we can also implement in South Africa. So you want me to pay for your... <laughs> So, so are you asking me to sponsor your trip to Sweden? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm requesting you to sponsor my trip to, to Sweden. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think I when... <laughs> okay. <laughs> the... <laughs> That. Uh, I think uh, looking at the time, um, we, we, we are wrapping up now. Uh, yeah, it's they, past my sleeping time. It's past the sleep. <laughs> I think the, the young man, when he, when, when he started, he said, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't sure why he's a little bit nervous, but towards the end of his uh, comment or question or request, I understood why. But well done on your bravery. And it's going to happen. <laughs> that was brave. Man. <laughs> that was brave. Uh, Mr. Tege, as we close, I think your, your grandmother was very prophetic when she named you. Yeah. Michael. Michael is one of the archangels and he's known for bravery yeah. and fighting. He's a warrior. Yeah. And then Solomon. Uh, noted as the wisest man who ever lived. And I believe you embody both of those personalities and we really thank you. Uh, you started as a teacher. You are still a teacher because we learned so much today and you will continue teaching Thanks. so many. Can we just stand up and honor him, please? So there's a lady at the back there called Tozama. Yeah, she'll arrange your trip for you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Can we give uh, confidence a round of applause? Wow. Wow. I think, I think you went very deep into making sure that we enjoy this conversation. It was really deep and uh, quite a lot of stuff. I mean, it gets engaged, and once you listen, you, can't, you don't even want to miss that moment. It was really, it was really uh, um, authentic, uh, and, and, and really going deep into those stories really uh, inspired all of us, I believe, and then I believe you took notes and you've learned a lot, and, and the book itself is really amazing, and, and, and thank you very much, uh, uh, we really appreciate that. So I think I'll just do a few announcements. My name is Tsepo Mohotu, and I'm the CEO of uh, ULP, and uh, it's good to really have you guys here, and uh, amazing. We've got great lineup of activities throughout the year in ULP, and if it's your first time being here, just know that we've got things happening here almost every month. And there's a lot of things that are happening, and we are geared to unleash your leadership potential. Yep. So let's clap hands for that. Thank you very much for that. And then just quickly, we, we, we've got a, 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 a quick announcement, two announcements, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close just now. So Fiona, are you there? Where's Fiona? Fiona, raise up. Stand up, sorry. Uh, that's Fiona. She's uh, in the leadership from a company called Unidrive. 
This is amazing company. You can see she's a young, young person. She's leading that company, and they're doing amazing work. And I'd like us to just watch the video quickly and see what Fiona and the team are doing at Unidrive. It's based in uh, the East End, close to Quatem. <laughs> Sound, please. We normally say spa. You know, they stop touching us, you see. Okay, just, just a second, let's see. There you go. Let's see, if it doesn't work, then I'll give them the other announcement, and then while you guys sort it out. Great, thanks. I think uh, let me give the other announcement while you guys try to sort it out. Thanks. Can you please fly the other slide? So uh, we're in the month of uh, August already. Uh, Happy Women's Month. Okay, awesome. So we, we, we really mean it in ULP, and uh, as such, we've got a great lineup program. We've got we doing this for we've been doing this for the past few years, and uh, we've got a. Uh, Empower Women in Energy Leadership Summit, happening right here. So this is a really great initiative, and happening right here. And if you've never seen such a wonderful leadership summit with women within the uh, 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 oil and gas or energy space, this is a place to be. This place gets transformed, and you won't even believe that you're still in mid-rent. So I want to urge you, register. Uh, the details are there, Empower, ulp.com forward slash Empower Women. Please go on and then RSVP now. If you're late, you will stand outside because this place gets packed. So I urge those who are here to please register. It's happening on the 9th of September. So we, we, we're letting a lot of the guys that are doing activities in September to go ahead. And then once it's finished in September, nice and fresh, we're going to have this uh, uh, wonderful activity. So RSVP, make sure that you come. We've got a great lineup of speakers that will be here who are already in the uh, energy space that are in leadership. And they'll be here. You'll be able to interact with them and... Uh, get a lot of information around what are the opportunities, what's happening within this particular industry. So I urge you to really join in with, uh, uh, with us on the, on, the, on the 9th of September. I wanted to make sure that you diarize it and it's there, and instead of me reading it for you. You've diarized it? You've diarized it? Awesome. Let's see if uh, the video is working now. Okay, they say it is. Let, let's check. Awesome. Round of applause. Please, let's support, let's support local businesses. And this is local. It's here. It's right here in Springs, giving opportunities to people in that community as well. So let's support and let's make sure that we share more information to other people about what this company is doing and refer if you know people that need these services. Is that okay? Awesome. Thank you very much, Ntate Teke, for honoring us today. Thank you, Confidence, Ntate Thank you very much also 
for this wonderful session. And we'll see you on the... Awesome. Have a good evening. God bless.